Well, welcome to the Tales from the Bay podcast. I'm Larry Kruger. He is Ryan Smith. And joining us today is Paul Hope, our Niners super fan from the other side of the pond as we uh, look back at the incredible win over the Cardinals in Mexico City, do a little state of the franchise. And then uh, a little bit later on, Jesse Sapolu, phenomenal guy, longtime 49er offensive lineman is going to stop by. We'll get Jesse's thoughts on what the 2022 Niners look like as they turn for home and try to make a big play for Glendale, Arizona in the Super Bowl. All right, guys, uh, good to see you all. Good to see you, Rye. Great to see you, Paul. It's been a while. How you been? Oh, it's great to be on, Larry. In fact, it feels great, baby. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Stealing Jimmy's line. Well, you know, the Niners were feeling great the other night. Uh, 38-10. They got a big win over the Arizona Cardinals, a Cardinal team that seemingly is in disarray. They've had a couple different coaches have incidents with violence towards women. Um, they had the whole thing about, you know, Cliff Kingsbury's rumored to be fired. He just got an extension. The whole back and forth between Kyler and Cliff Kingsbury. And, and then the 49ers show up and just absolutely beat them down. And the thing that, that really jumped out to me, and I mentioned it earlier in the week to Ryan, was just, I was surprised how early in the game the Cardinals basically threw up the white flag. I mean, the Cardinals, you know, I chart the game, so I'll, I'll give you what, I, what I've got here. On the Cardinals' 10th possession, um, it was 4th and 6 from, um, from the 49ers' 47-yard line with 8 minutes left in the 4th quarter, and they were down 27 points at this point. 37 to 10, or uh, I know I guess it was 27 to 10 at that point, but they were down a lot. So I guess it would no, it was 38 10. 38 10 at that point, and they're punting. They're punting with eight minutes left to go in the game. Uh, to me, that was my first takeaway. Was now we've seen two divisional opponents, the nine, uh, the Cardinals in Mexico City, the Rams in the last game, basically just go no moss, no more. I want no more. No more Nick Bosa. No more pass rush. No more hard hits. We're just punting and going on to the next week. We're going to lick our wounds. We're not trying to beat you. You do that with two minutes left, okay? Eight minutes left in the fourth quarter, and you're punting from the 47-yard line? I mean, and it wasn't fourth and 26. It was fourth and six. And you have DeAndre Hopkins. To me, that was the biggest surprise of the game was that, the Cardinals, the non-competitive nature, and I think it's just a glimpse into their dysfunction. What do you guys think? Yeah, uh, I, I agree. And I think that the play everyone's pointing to is uh, the business decisions that were made on the George Kittle second touchdown, where it looked like, you know, we were playing Madden and uh, we you use the truck stick and but there's just no player there and you never see that in the nfl why would someone do a truck stick like i'm pretty sure that's what kittle was trying to do he's like tr trying to truck a ghost and he just wandered right into the end zone and yeah i think that the, the my my question about that is like is that is that the coaching are they kind of quitting on the team are they kind of quitting on the quarterback is it the altitude. I mean, the Niners did go and practice in Colorado Springs, which is the same thing that Belichick did when he was going to Mexico City, and then they rolled. Um, I, I think they, what do they say? The Cardinals used um, maybe some sort of masks to some altitude masks, but uh, I'm guessing it doesn't replace the, it's not as good as the real thing. And so maybe that was part of it. Maybe they were just so exhausted. Um but yeah, it that was a that was just a really good thing to see because the Niners they need to take care of these lesser teams and Arizona weirdly has always given Shanahan trouble, <laughs> which is funny. Uh, but yeah, Paul, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. It's interesting you mentioned the Kittle play. When I went back and reviewed the game, the Debo Samuel touchdown, there was equally some business decisions made when you look at the yeah. other angle. That he could have been stopped. I mean, obviously, at the time, Larry and Ryan, I was leaping around at 2 a.m. in the UK celebrating that touchdown. And I think it showed in the preparation of the team. Nick Bosa talked about it after the game where he said the altitude training definitely helped because in Colorado, we struggled. But in Mexico, we seemed to get that second wind. And the Kittle touchdown, George is a big favourite over the pond. So for him to have a two-touchdown game, 
I mean, that second half, like Larry said, it was probably one of the easiest that we've seen. And for a divisional rival game, that shouldn't be happening. I mean, Carl Shanahan traditionally struggles against the Cardinals, but then Jimmy G tends to have a good game against them. Hence why I stole his uh, catchphrase at the start. I mean, where, where, what do you say about Jimmy G, gents? I mean, four touchdowns, he was passing the ball. It's, it was telling for me that we all thought going into this game that we were going to run the ball more. But when you look at the stats that the Cardinals were the worst defence against yards after the catch, and we have got a pretty good offence yards after the catch. And me and Ryan were talking off air, Larry, about CMC and the dimension that he's added to the 49ers offence. So for me, we dominated the Cardinals and it was great to see. And I did stay up, Larry, till about 7am in the UK, <laughs> absorbing all the content because I couldn't go to sleep after that game. That was probably the best performance of the season. Yeah. Um, and I think we have to talk about Jimmy Garoppolo. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, 20 of 29, 228 yards, four touchdowns, completed nearly 70% of his passes on a night where, you know, it was driving rain at the kickoff, a little bit of a sloppy field. Um, and Jimmy, ex, you know, uh, operated expertly. And when I was looking at <clears throat> his numbers for the year, Garoppolo now ranks fourth in the NFL this year in passer rating at 104.1. Um, you know, and we talked a lot about this earlier in the week, but Garoppolo is known for for really two things, I think. He's known for his incredible record as a starting quarterback, right? He He's won... A high percentage, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but he's won a very high percentage of his NFL starts. And he's also kind of known for making the colossal error, you know, the mistake that gets you beat, uh, the mistake that turns over the football, sometimes in your own territory. And it's those huge negative plays that have, I think have kind of clouded, um, you know, our evaluation of him as a player. Now, over the last month, guys, what we've seen, and we saw it in this game as well. We saw it in the early part of this game, the first series. The first pass, the second play of the game, he's got George Kittle on a little screen, but the timing wasn't right. Kittle turned, Garoppolo wasn't ready, Garoppolo was ready, Kittle was had his head turned. Um, the timing was off, and instead of Jimmy just trying to thread that needle and force it in there, he just threw it into the turf, went to the next play. And we're seeing that more and more from Jimmy. And to me, that's the final frontier for Jimmy Garoppolo. We know he can make plays, but we also know he makes a lot of negative plays. And if he can eradicate the negative plays from his his weekly equation, I think he's going to he's gonna be a huge winner, and the Niners are as well. And Brady does it. Rodgers does it. Lots of great quarterbacks you know, you don't have to win every down. There's nothing in the box score that says how many of the 75 offensive plays did the quarterback win. No, it's do you win the game? How many points do you score? So I just think that's real growth. I saw it in the, the Charger game. I saw it in the Rams games. He's throwing the ball in the turf for the most part. Now, the Rams, the one first Rams game, he did throw two to Ramsey, and Ramsey dropped them. But I'm just talking about really in the last few weeks – we're seeing Garoppolo understand that throwing the ball into the turf on first or second down and going to the next play is not the worst thing. And to me, it's the reason they're they're you know looking like a, a viable Super Bowl contender and why they're kind of like the the talk of the nation right now as far as nobody wants to play the Niners because everybody knows Niners are talented, both sides of the ball, really good coach, and now they got a quarterback who's not making the crucial mistake. Give me your guys' thoughts on what you saw from Garoppolo. Isn't it funny that, uh, just real quick before I talk about Garoppolo, isn't it funny how just the recency bias, like the Cowboys beat the living crap out of the Vikings, the 8-1 and one Vikings, that the, I think the 8-1 and one Vikings, who just beat the Bills, the Cowboys beat the crap out of them on the road, and then... It, all it takes is like one Monday, big Monday night game by the Niners. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, Niners are the scariest team in the NFC. Like, and they completely threw out the Dallas one. Uh, but yeah, Jimmy, since they got McCaffrey, nine total touchdowns, one interception. Um, he's had a clean sheet for three straight games. He's been, you know, passing like over like two. Usually with Jimmy, in some of these wins, it's like, you know, 160 yards passing. What? He's been like over 230 pretty much every game. Um, 
he's just looked, he's looked, uh, yeah, he's probably looked his best since 2019. And I think that McCaffrey has a huge, huge, huge part in that. And just his ability, I honestly think he probably is their best route runner. It's him or Ayuk. Um, and I think, I think maybe Ayuk is a little slip more slippery, but McCaffrey's more consistent. And I think that that little safety blanket for him is just opening everything up and kind of giving him more confidence. And, um, you know, the one other thing I'll throw out there is the, the chargers game after the bye, we, I think that we all sort of thought, oh man, here's, this is when Debo McCaffrey, all of this craziness, crazy offense is going to get unleashed. They kind of just ran the ran the ball and played very conservatively. Now, is that just because of the Chargers are really bad against the run? It's that simple, and they, that was the game plan. And then versus the Cardinals, you know, they they knew they could throw it, and like Paul said, that they're not good at you know tackling after the catch. Um, so was was that the reason why the offense wasn't as explosive versus the Chargers? And, and it's simply game plan. Um, and is that just, so? Shanahan can just choose either one. Or is it actually going to be kind of a week-to-week thing with whether or not they're able to really, really rev up the offense like this? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's game plan specific, Rye. And I, I'd be interested to see what Paul thinks on that. But I'd, I looked at those numbers going into that Charger game, and the Chargers were a really bad run defense for the year that had gotten even worse over the last month and then had come into the game the week before losing Austin Johnson, their big big uh, defensive tackle. So I think the game plan was definitely run it. And I don't, I don't know that Shanahan got what he wanted in the first half because they, they threw it a little bit more. They Niners only averaged three, two, a carry um, in the first half of that game against the chargers. But in the second half, it became the Elijah Mitchell, st- uh, the show and, and they really ran it effectively in this game. I think the numbers showed that the Cardinals pass defense was susceptible and, I still think it was interesting the way Kyle um, game planned the game because it was almost like he said, first half, we're going to come out throwing it. We're going to spread everybody out. We're going to throw it to McCaffrey. We're going to get the ball to McCaffrey and Kittle because we think those are our two biggest mismatches, and we're going to ride that. And if you look at halftime, Kittle and McCaffrey had probably um, accounted for about 75 80% of the Niners' yards. Second half, though, it was a lot more Elijah Mitchell. And, man, did he look effective running out the clock, you know, getting huge, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine-yard runs, sometimes on first down. Um, so it was it was interesting to me the way he split up his backs. A lot of McCaffrey and throwing the ball in the first half, a lot of Mitchell and running the ball in the second half. That might be the recipe we see. What did you see, Paul? Well, I have to share a quick Jimmy G story with you, Larry and Ryan. So yeah. we do the 49 Fair for UK pod. And we always make bold predictions before the game. And echoing what you'd said, I'd seen that change in Jimmy, that he wasn't forcing the ball and that he was throwing the ball away. So I called for a zero interception game from Jimmy for the first time in his career for three games in a row. And I got laughed at, Larry. In fact, I took a couple of screenshots because some people were going to come for me with receipts. <laughs> so I've cashed those receipts in, Larry, and I was saying to Ryan, one of the guys in the group, is he said that he would buy a Jimmy G jersey if um, Jimmy didn't throw an interception. So he stuck to his word. But what you're saying is it's interesting that since we've added McCaffrey, we've averaged about 28.5 points per game. And it just seems to give Jimmy that extra confidence. Like you're saying, Larry, he goes through his progressions, but if he needs that safety valve, he dumps it off. And what better weapon to dump it off to than CMC? And I think answering your question, Ryan, the NFL, as we know in the UK, there's fine margins. And I think they take it week to week. I think Kyle Shanahan does look at the opposition. He looks at what can we exploit. Like you said there, we all knew the Chargers were not very good against the run. I didn't think we'd see as much as Mitchell, Larry, as what we did. I think you're right, CMC seemed to struggle in the first half. But what a great problem that is. Oh, CMC struggling, so we'll just plug Mitchell in. And again (laughs) against the Cardinals. I mean, I'd called for Ayuk to get two touchdowns on Monday night, Larry. And a few people were saying, oh, we're going to be running the ball. But again... I'm fairly new to going back and watching the game and watching the tape, but certain things jump off, and Kyle Shanahan is very consistent with his play calling. But I do have to say, my favourite touchdown was the Debo one. The way he manipulated that defence. I mean, I was sat at home thinking the ball's going that way, and then the way they just threw the ball in the air. And I'd actually said, Larry, to one of my friends, we tried to rush Debo a couple of plays before, and he got stuffed. And I said, I want to see a jet sweep. I want to see something different where Debo can attack the edge. 
And it was as if Carl Shanahan was listening to Little Old Me in the UK because about three players later, Debo. And it was like a carbon copy of the Seattle touchdown a couple of years ago. And like you said, Ryan, some business decisions when you watch it back, some of the Cardinals players will be a bit sad. But yeah, I think Jimmy, you've hit the nail on the head, Larry, with your analysis. I think Jimmy is showing. And for me, it could be to do with the QB coach. I think not a lot's been said about um, Greasy coming in. And he was brought in to work with Trey. But he's obviously added something to Jimmy's game. I, I don't know what you two think, whether I'm going down a rabbit hole with that analysis. No, I, I think, you know, you're talking about a guy in Greasy who played the position. And so he can he can speak from experience. And, and you know, I think Brian also is the right personality, you know, to deal with Trey or with Jimmy. And I think he's respectful. Uh, he's not one of these, you know, he he's not from the coaching profession, right? So And he's been a player. So I think he comes at it from let me help you as opposed to I'm talking down to you and I'm you're you'll do this because I told you to do this you know um, you know he's I think he it's a more of a sharing of ideas and you can kind of see the way Jimmy and Trey and even Purdy for that matter react to Brian on the sideline I thought the the Debo play that you're referring to was so beautifully blocked you had you know you had uh, Husechek got a great block you got Trent Williams bury somebody. The, what I also got out of that play is that Buda Baker has tremendous heart. Buda Baker got blocked early in that play, and then you, he got right? up off the ground and chased that play down on the back end. And I think he he he's the Cardinal defender that got the closest to Debo. I think both, you know, I mean, really the entire time. I I, I just thought Buda Baker was spectacular. Um, and it, as far as as Jimmy goes, you know, it, I think it's also. The, if you ask Kyle Shanahan, and this is where John Lynch, I think, and I've been saying this the last couple of days, I think John Lynch deserves the executive of the year if the 49ers can make it to the Super Bowl. Why? Because look at the schedule. Look at that trade. Look at who that who McCaffrey could have gone to, the Rams. The Niners probably lose that game against the Rams. The whole season could have tumbled out of control if they had lost that game to the Rams in L.A. Instead, they won that game with McCaffrey as a major star. So, I mean... That was, I think the timing of the trade was perfect. But even beyond that, I think you could probably make an argument that Kyle Shanahan, this, you know, and he's had some great backs, right? He had Tevin Coleman and, and uh, Devontae Freeman in Atlanta. They, they were a great combination. He's had some incredible combinations here. But I think the best combination he's ever had at running back is what he has right now. Because he's got a guy in McCaffrey that he can use in any way imaginable. And as you said, Paul, he's the ultimate safety valve. And he also has a guy in Mitchell who's the the perfect put-the-game-away back because he gets every yard that it's blocked for, and he falls forward on every play, and he's fumbled one time in his career. So now you've got this really dependable, really uh, hard-charging back that can ice the game, and you've got this gadget wizard, big play monster in McCaffrey that you can scheme up anything you want for. I think it's, I think, you know... I think it's the. I think if you really look at it, it's the perfect running back tandem for Kyle's offense. But I think McCaffrey, if, as we hone in on him a little bit more, he's the perfect complement to take Garoppolo to that next level. What you said at beginning at the beginning about um, McCaffrey being the safety valve, there was a play early in this game where he looked, he scanned the entire field, and then the Cardinals still hadn't rushed him, and then finally here comes a rusher, and Jimmy kind of changes his arm angle and just dumped it right down to McCaffrey, and I think McCaffrey got like eight yards or nine yards on the play, maybe it might have been twelve, um, but it wasn't a th that would have been a throw it into the ground, throw it away, no gain kind of a play. Instead, you got this incredible safety valve. And now you're looking, you're staying ahead of the chains, and it just helps Garoppolo keep the pressure off. I, I think in a lot of ways, McCaffrey with Garoppolo, if, there, if there's anybody who should be thrilled that McCaffrey's there, it's Garoppolo. Because he is a much better quarterback when he's got a McCaffrey safety valve. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable to watch. I feel like, you know, it's like when you watch Devontae with Rodgers, and then you took away Devontae, and then you looked at Rodgers this year, it doesn't look the same. Well, you know, the quarterbacks get a lot of the credit. Sometimes it's the receivers. You add a receiver like McCaffrey to a Garoppolo who operates underneath, and it just gives him 
a weapon that he did not have before, and it gives this offense a dimension it did not have before. And I just think it makes the 49ers a truly dangerous football team for any team um, in the months ahead. Good luck to Philly. Good luck to Dallas, uh, because those teams are probably going to do a little collision course with the 49ers, and I think the Niners may get them. Yeah, I think 2022, um, you look at quarterback play, and a lot of a lot has been made of sort of uh, you know Rogers and Stafford and these guys that you're used to just balling out every year. And instead, this year they're they're kind of having down years. And it got me thinking. You know, everyone's looking for the Mahomes. Everyone's looking for the Herbert. Everyone's looking for the Josh Allen. But there's just there's never going to be um, a bunch of those guys. I mean, even if you look at this upcoming. Uh, quarterback class I I wouldn't know where to identify somebody like that there's only going to be a hand handful of of guys that can really carry an entire offense onto themselves so with that in mind you know I think in 2022 football in the NFL you can either win with the guys like Mahomes and Josh Allen and all that or you can win with these guys that are facilitators that are surrounded by weapons and a great offensive mind And so you look at like Miami, okay, Tua is, he has all the intangibles, he, he, all the guys in the locker room love him, and he just gets the ball out quick, he's accurate, you know, he doesn't complain, he gets the ball to Tyreek, he gets it to Waddle, the Mostert, all that kind of stuff. You, then you look at Jimmy G, he's a great locker room guy, and he gets it to, he gets it to all the different weapons. I think that that is the other model that is going to be able to work. That model and then there's also the Mahomes model. And it's very much like basketball where Jimmy G is kind of just a pass first point guard. He's not really a scoring point guard. He, he has to facilitate. He has to have weapons. He has to have an offensive system that he can work with. Mahomes is like Steph Curry. He is a point guard, but he also can just score at, at will. He's also the team's best scorer. He can do anything he wants. So I, I I'm, I'm feeling more and more confident about Jimmy G and, um, you know, I'll, you guys maybe get another word in, and then we do have to throw to our guest. And I, I have to say, uh, Paul, with those predictions you had last week with the IU two touchdowns and the Jimmy G no picks, I'd love it if you wanted to hang around and uh, for our preview segment because we might actually get some gold, maybe make some money off it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm cashing them in, Ryan, because if I'd got them wrong, people would have come after me. But the final thing I was going to say, Larry, I think the CMC dimension allowed Kittle's first touchdown. You know when Jimmy looked like he was going to escape the pocket? When you watch it back on the old 22, the Cardinals' defense seemed to sit off him. And I was thinking, I can't see CMC on the tape. And then Jimmy took a couple of yards forward. And I think every 49er fan was thinking, slide, slide, you've got the first down. And then he just popped the ball out to Kittle. And it was just so easy. And you think, add that to our dimension. Like you said, Ryan, you know, Jimmy isn't a Patrick Mahomes. And you were talking about the Eagles, you are talking about the Cowboys. You are right. We have got recency bias. You know, as 49er fans, we're sat here thinking, we're the best team in the NFC. And nobody's going to want to face us. But those quarterbacks you've mentioned have to come up against our defence. I, I don't know how you guys are feeling. I mean, obviously the Chiefs blew us out. But I do think Ryan's has demonstrated that when he makes an error, he can correct it. And the fact that we've shut out three NFL teams in the second half, three games in a row... I don't think that's something that should be taken lightly by the teams in the NFC. Yeah, that's a good point. And then, you know, the the Niners have more experience than the Eagles. The Niners are playing better right now than the Eagles. As far as Dallas, Dallas's defense is stopping the run. They're 26th in the NFL, uh, giving up 136 yards per game on the ground. I think both those teams <clears throat> are great. You know, they're terrific teams. I think Niners could beat either of those teams in the playoffs. One other point I need to make, and I know we got a break, but the Trey Lance injury, guys, I know, you know, we don't talk about this and there's a lot, everybody's got a different opinion about what Trey was going to do this year, but it may have been a blessing in disguise. Uh, look at Mac Jones, Davis Mills, Zach Wilson, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields. They've all had their moments where you say, wow, but they've also all had their moments where you go, uh, and, None of those teams, I think, are probably headed towards the playoffs. None of them are headed towards a title. That's for sure. And you just kind of wonder if young quarterbacks, it's not a straight line approach. You know, it's not a straight line ascendancy, I should say, to the top. For every Mahomes, 
Um, <clears throat> there's, you know, more somebody like more like Josh Allen, who's going to take some time, <clears throat> take some time to develop. Mac Jones, Davis Mills, Zach Wilson, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields. These guys have had some great moments, but they also have struggled. And if the Niners had Trey Lance, I have to think that he would be doing exactly what those guys were doing. Maybe not the exact issues that they have, but up in what I would call uneven performances week to week. A really strong performance, a really down performance, not that dependable. So the fact that the Niners are in their Super Bowl window and they had this injury that forced them to go to Garoppolo, when we look back at it at the end of the year, very well could be a blessing in disguise. All right. On that being said, um, let's let's take a timeout. Let's come back. We'll, we'll, we've got the great uh, Jesse Sapolu, who Jesse Sapolu knew nothing but winning, and this guy is another guy who came into the NFL, had a number, had a couple key injuries that cost him a couple seasons, and a lot of people thought that he was a bust and that he was not going to play in the NFL. And then he goes on to have a career with ch- multiple championships, multiple Pro Bowls, as respected as any 49er in the history of the franchise. Cannot wait, guys, to talk to Jesse Sapolu. And he's going to join us next on the Tales from the Bay podcast. Larry Kruger, Ryan Smith, Paul Hope along with us today as well. And we'll continue with more coming up next. All right, welcome back to the Tales from the Bay podcast. Larry Kruger and Ryan Smith, and we have a special guest, former 49er offensive lineman Jesse Sapolu. And Jesse's story is a great one. He was an 11th round pick in the 83 draft, had a couple of early seasons where Jesse had some injuries and they weren't really sure. You know, I think uh, Trey Lance would be a good guy for to talk to you about kind of a slow start because of physical issues to the beginning of his career, and then hopefully he can do what you did, and that was become a Pro Bowl player two times over, a four-time Super Bowl champion. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'm really – I didn't realize when we had you on is that you're one of only six players to actually have four Super Bowl rings, and you are the only one who has it from 84, 88, 89, and 94. The other five guys have 81, 84, 88, 89. You were there in 94, the last the last time this franchise was crowned champion and won on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, do you, What are your memories of that night in Miami against the Chargers? Well, I, I remember it was uh, kind of over early. <laughs> yeah. I think we exploded on them in the first quarter, and it, it really never got close. But... Uh, you know, it's funny that you mentioned about the. I'm one of six guys to win four rings. You know, they went ahead and took a poster with the other five guys, not <laughs> knowing that I was going to be the, the sixth guy. So there was a poster out there of Eddie D and the five guys that won the first four. And then, uh, you know, we never really got a chance to take a poster with me in it. So. <laughs> That's a funny story about. Oh love man, we we loved watching your career, and you know if I if I was using a word to describe your career to somebody who hadn't seen you, like Ryan, who's younger, is is uh, perseverance. And you know, like if you could talk to Trey Lance right now, uh, and, and somehow relate to him about how you know he's gung ho to get his NFL career started, and it hasn't happened, partially due to injury. How did you cope with that? How did you stay focused and stay – how did it increase your determination to, to not just make it but to become a pro bowler? Well, you know, I it's a little bit different, I think, uh, with Trey. Trey was the second pick of the draft. You know, I was an 11th-round draft choice. So, sure. Uh, the chances of uh, – but I, I think the big difference is that I had a great rookie year. I came out of nowhere. I started three games my rookie year, which is unheard of back in those days as an 11th round draft choice. So coming into my second year, I mean, I was, uh, you know, Bob Kitchen was talking about I would be make, making some noise and break into the starting lineup. And then I broke my foot uh, working out in the off season, And then I broke it again, you know, after making the comeback uh, halfway through the season. I think I played three games uh that my second year and then uh, I broke my left leg <laughs> my left tibia uh, in training camp my third year so I went up 
to Bill, and I knew I was an eleventh round draft choice, and at some point, they're not going to be uh, patient with me. And uh, you know, you know, Bill Walsh told me don't be crazy. And Bob McKittrick said, if you're willing to put the work back in the rehab all the way back, you know, um, I will give you a, an opportunity to stay on this team because of that potential that I showed the first year. So with with Trey, I think. He's injured, but he was brought in as a guy that could take over the organization. So it's a little di different from that standpoint, but it's similar in the fact that, uh, uh, you know, I can encourage him to never, ever give up. You know, I, I could understand uh, what our DB uh, of a rate is going through right now with his injuries. You know, right. uh, his luck is even worse than mine. Uh, but all I can do is be positive. I know I posted something about that, and fans were jumping all over it. Well, you know, he's, he's different from you. I'm like, no, it's not. It's it's about encouraging uh, a guy that's put in a lot of work that has the ability to never, ever give up. So it's a, it's a tough situation all the way around. But I think Trey, uh, the organization is still high on him. Uh, but as of right now, Jimmy is doing a great job. Uh, leading the San Francisco 49ers. So we're fortunate that he's still here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, talking a little bit about now, uh, so we were in the locker room earlier today and we had a chance to catch up with uh, Jake Brendel, uh, you know, center right now. Uh, he had a block on that Debo Samuel reverse that mm -hmm. I think he was about 30, 33 yards down the field when he laid that. And I asked him, I was like, is that, about the farthest you've blocked somebody down the field uh, in, in, that you can remember. He's like, man, it has been a long time. So with that in mind, do you have any blocks or like that, that you can really remember where it was like, man, highlight play, uh, you know, running down the field, got to show off your athleticism. Um, yeah. I'd just be interested to hear. Uh, many a times because that was the strength of <laughs> too many to remember. That I, played on. Um, I, I remember, uh, you remember the, the San Francisco Giants used to play at Candlestick. So sure. the first three, four road, uh, home games, you know, we're playing on part of it is on is a, on the infield, you know, of the baseball field because the Giants are still playing. And uh, the Atlanta Falcons used to be in the NFC West, and they had a free safety named Scott Case. Big hitter. You know, big hitter. And uh, – you know, I, I, uh, it was a reverse, and I was the center that came out flat and uh, happened to be Scott Case in a way, and, and, and I kind of drove him, I would say, 30-something 30, 30 yards into the infield. <laughs> I, just, I just remember getting up and saying to myself, maybe I shouldn't have drove, drove him into the infield because I was all scraped up myself getting up. But, uh, but, yeah, you know, with all those long sweeps that we used to run with Roger Craig high knee, that's a lot of running, you know, uh, playing guard in those days. And also when I was a center, I was one of the first, maybe the first center to ever pull out of the center position because I was a converted guard. And Bob McKittrick wanted to use that that speed. You know, Guy McIntyre and myself had, even though I switched to center, to take advantage of the Minnesota defenses that we ran into in the playoffs in those days. So uh, exciting to see that. It was a great uh, play design. I saw that, and then the, you know it was it was meant to uh, go. I mean, uh, they faked it to the right, and they and then turned it back. And our center did a nice job going flat, timing uh, Debo coming over, and and he became the featured guy. You know, to uh, have the key block down the field, which he did a nice job with it. I'll tell you, it's I see him around sometimes now these days, and and I, he's such a nice guy. But man, Keith Millard was just a monster and they had Millard and Dolman and Dolman was a all day deal for Bubba and Millard was an all day deal for you guys inside. And then I think Henry Thomas might've been in there in that mix. One, of, You know, but talk to us about, about that combo Millard and Dolman, because, you know, people think of all these teams that stood between the Niners and more rinks, the Cowboys and the Giants. And, uh, but man, it really, it was the Vikings that upset the Niners in '81 with Jerry Burns, and and it and it was you guys that beat them uh, in '88 as kind of a payback with Roger having a big day running behind you guys. But 
Talk to us a little bit about that line because I, I'm pers- I mean, as a 49er fan, I always had tons of confidence in Bob McKittrick, and I've got a lot of confidence now because they've got Chris Forster, and I think O-line coaches are important. But to me, man, that Viking front was something that you guys had to conquer, and you did it. What was it like going up against big Keith Millard? Well, you know, one of our better teams uh, got upset in 87. Yeah, 15-1, you know, right? Team. Right. Um, you know, uh, it was a, a – it was a strike year, but once we came in, I think we we had the best record. I think uh, we played the Bears on a Monday night, and the Bears came in with the best record at that tied with us at that time. I think we were both uh, eleven and two. Played on a Monday night, and we beat them forty-five to three or something like that. Yeah. So we were the heavy favorites going in, but you know, at that time, we were just starting to uh, experience. The, the system that the Floyd Peters had with that with that Mike great D line, D line coach for right, years and years D line coach their their thing was get after the quarterback and let let the linebackers uh, become uh, res, you know play responsibility defense if you guys uh, think back about it uh, I think the Bears had the rec I mean uh, the Vikings had the record coming into the playoffs in uh, eighty eight or eighty nine with seventy one sacks I mean think about that. Yeah. You know, a double-digit sack is a pretty good year for any D lineman. So you divide 71 sacks, you can have six guys rotating that had double-digit with that group. Uh, I think also by the time we – I think we played the Vikings three years in a row. They beat us in 87. We beat them in 88. And we beat them again in 89. Yeah. So that group was that group was in our way pretty pretty good because they were pretty good. And I think by 1989, they had a young uh, defensive tackle that was also a backup to Keith Millard named John Randall. So that wasn't bad guy. <laughs> exactly. Who's That's... Also in, who's also in the Hall of Fame now. So, I mean, think, we, we, we had some D linemen that, or D lines that we faced during those years that were pretty darn good. And I always tell people all the time that, uh, you know, the Bears, when you talk about a single defensive year uh, that sticks out as the best defense ever. I mean, a lot of people, or more people than uh, the defense that gets the most votes will probably be the 1985 Bears. Well, that defense were together in 84, 85, 86, 87, 88. And we had to face those guys <laughs> all of those years. And they had Steve McMichael, Mongo. They had Dan Hampton, who's a Hall of Famer. Richard Dent's a Hall of Famer, you know. Uh, great course, linebackers. Great linebackers. Singletary, Rivera, and uh, Otis Wilson was a, a perennial all-pro. Uh, they had some DBs that were great players, you know. And so those are – it's the reason why the NFC during my career won 15 straight Super Bowls, if you look back on it. Because my rookie year, we got upset in Washington. Uh, bad, after, calls, you know, bad calls, bad calls. That's right that bad call in 83 and then the Redskins went and the Raiders beat them with that long uh you know uh turn Marcus around Allen run, run. Right, Marcus Allen yeah that was their that was their last Super Bowl I they never won another Super Bowl until after I was retired and I played 15 years so think about, and the reason why is because the NFC was so deep you know with the Hogs uh Joe Gibbs uh Hogs of course the Bears of of uh Mike Ditka, Lawrence Taylor's uh, 86 Giants. Giants. Yeah. It Leonard really, Marshall. Really, uh, it was a really, really deep conference for all those years. And for us to come out as the team of the decade, and we we hung on to that excellence when we got challenged by uh, the Cowboys that came back in the 90s. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a dynasty time of the San Francisco 49ers that a lot of people still look up to to this day because we haven't won another Super Bowl after 94. We've been to two, but we haven't won another one. So uh, those are the days and those are the memories that you brought up with all those battles with Keith Millard and that group. It's a great, great time to be a football player, especially um, with San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, I mean, seriously. And it was – it was there were some great years there. Um, 81 was the first go-round. You weren't there for that. But you were there for 84, 
84 mm-hmm. was a 15 and one season. Maybe uh, some people felt like that was the greatest 49er team of all time. Then the 88 team was 10 and six and caught fire at the end of the year. And I think to this day had the most entertaining Super Bowl ever, uh, Super Bowl 23 over the Bengals. And then, you know, the, the, the 89 Niners, I mean, you know, people who claim that John Elway's better than Joe Montana, I'm like, you obviously did not see the 89 <laughs> Super Bowl because Joe was, you know, incredible and Elway fired everything into the turf and up and up, up and away. But I have to ask you this question. What's the best Niner team you were on? Was it, would, was, would you say it was 84? Would you say it was 89? Would you, I mean, the D, the 94 team had Dion and, and uh, Eric Davis and Merton Hanks and Tim McDonald in the secondary and Bryant Young and Stubby up front and, um, you know, still a great old line and Steve and all those weapons and Ricky and Jerry. What's the greatest team you've ever, you were ever on, Jesse? I would say 1989, and no disrespect to 1984, but there's a reason why 89 uh, is a team that I think is the best team. Um, Joe left the game at the end of the third quarter, I think, or maybe with 11 minutes left in the fourth, throwing five touchdown passes, and it was easy. In the Super Bowl against in the Denver, Super Bowl. yep. It was it was a it was an easy five. Eighty four teams did not have Jerry Rice and John Taylor, so that alone, <laughs> right? You know, makes you think about. It. But we still had Roger Craig on the eighty four and eighty nine team, and eighty nine team had that. You know, I. And then uh, defense, the defenses were were pretty close, and of course the eighty four team beat Marino, a thirty eight. Uh, we we kind of beat them decisively but the 89 team with Elway and the Denver Broncos was the number one defense 55 10 us, wasn't it 55 if, if they 10, kept us in the game that game could have been 70 right it would have been uh uh you know but at that time we thought 55 okay man that's a record that's great you know we didn't know the rules were going to change decades later when when we retired you know we didn't know that they were going to ease up on on mugging wide receivers and things like that. We, you know, now that I think about, I uh, think back about it, maybe they should have put us in, uh, kept us in another couple of drives and, and, and let Joe throw seven, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that the other guy that broke Joe's record was our guy, Steve Young. You know? Right. But Steve Young, uh, with that great 95, 94 team, uh, which the, the game was in January of 95. We broke the record, but we worked hard to break that record. We played all the way into the fourth, you know. Jerry uh, played but, with a separated shoulder in the second right, half, right? Right. He played with a separate. That's why he didn't play in the Pro Bowl when we all went to Hawaii the next week. But, uh, but we played hard because we knew the record was uh, what was the 49ers, but we wanted to expand that record a little bit. So we wanted to do it for Steve, and we played hard for Steve, and try to get it done. And we got it done halfway through the fourth. But the five that Joe had in that Super Bowl 24 was pretty easy. If you go back and watch the game, it was it was just a mismatch. It was and a coronation. Defense, it was a coronation of of dominance and uh, coronation and at, of dominance. At that point in time, as a 49er fan watching it, it felt like it was going to last forever. It felt <laughs> like like the team was going to be able to do that. Literally. Like that, it, you know, 90, 91. If you would asked me that day, how long will the Niners run continue? I would have thought for sure five years, six years, seven years more. Um, I got to ask you because I think the Hall of Fame doesn't recognize assistant coaches, and they should. And you played for what I consider a Hall of Fame assistant coach in Bob McKittrick. And mm-hmm. I was talking to an old football guy, Jesse, a few months ago, and we're talking about, you know, what – <clears throat> what do you really need to win the Super Bowl? And we talk about quarterback and this and that. But a lot this coach, old coach, said, you know what? You need two really great coaches. You need a great O line coach and you need a great defensive backfield coach. Because those two positions really need a lot of coordination. And you guys had two, I think, Hall of Fame guys in Ray Rhodes and Bob McKittrick, and guys that weren't just great teachers of the position. They both could find gems like yourself at the end of the draft um 
Ray Rhodes did it for years. Bob did it. Or Bob did it for years. Um, you know, Harris Barton was a first round pick, but most of the Niner offensive linemen of the day were not first or second round draft choices. What made Bob McKittrick so special? Um, Bob was a very demanding offensive line coach in his own way. He never uh, demeaned us, you know, uh, as an example, you know, uh, I remember, you know, my, my ankles was hurting and, and I had an injection done, you know, and I'm thinking, oh man, you know, Bob's going to appreciate me for doing this. You know, I'm injecting my, my ankle so I can play for the team, you know, so I'm sitting there, you know, just had the needle pulled out of my ankle. I'm icing it and I'm not supposed to put any weight on it until the next day so I can play on Sunday. And Bob walks into the training room and says, uh, did you get your ankle injected? I'm like, yes, coach. And he goes, oh, well, by tomorrow, you won't know the difference between the good one and the one that just got injected. So, <laughs> so the message was sent that that is what I'm supposed to do. Right. And that 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 uh, establishes a high standard of expectation for us. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, like, this past year, I just got nominated, finally got nominated for the semifinals for the Hall of Fame. Congratulations and, on that. You know, but, you know, I'm, I sit back and I'm thinking, you know, they switched me four different times, you know, and two of those times they switched me to help us win the Super Bowl. We went on to win. And, you know, I'm thinking, man, I, I hope they appreciate that because it kind of sacrificed my ability to have more Pro Bowls. Right. You know, I, I, I made the Pro Bowls at two different positions, you know, but at that particular time, I wasn't worried about uh, my nomination to the Hall of Fame because it was about the team. It was about winning championships. You know, was it easy for me to switch? Because they switched me back to guard in 94, which was my 12th year. <laughs> And, you know, when you play guard for the 49ers, you better be able to run. Yeah, you know? better be able to get out. Oh, they, yeah. You get somebody get in out. space. Right. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm this is my eighth year as a center, and you're switching me back out? after, You know, and, and Bob said to me, I said, he says, you know, I, I know this is your 12th year, and, and uh, you know, we, we couldn't find anybody in free agency that we think would be better than you because the last we remember when you played guard it was a Super Bowl 23 in Miami, you know, with me and guys, the pulling guards, you know, I, and uh, when Bob switched me to center, I gained 15 pounds. I went out and gained, you know, 15 pounds because I knew I had to deal with bigger guys in the middle, you know, and now that I'm at guard, you know, I'm thinking, should I lose the 15 pounds or just play with it? And I kind of ended up playing with it a little bit, but that's what Bob did. You know, he, he had that niche of putting lines together, whatever it took, you know, uh, they, you know, Bob called me, uh, in 94 and after I was, a a, a, a pro bowl and on pro uh, center, he says, uh, just, what do you think? You know, guy McIntyre left to go to green Bay. And uh, he said, you know, we we need you to move back out to guard and we'll get Bart Oates to come in and play center. And if Bart has any problems with making the calls, you're right next to him. <laughs> so it was at that particular time, um, Larry, it was team over self. Yeah. That was the standard. That was the expectation. You know, um, when you think about John McBay that just passed, right? And he has five uh, Super Bowl trophies as a general manager, and yet there's a general, there's a couple of general managers that went into the Hall of Fame that has what two Super Bowls? We we it's hard for us to figure that out. You know, what? How is the Buffalo Bills having more inductees than the 49ers that went five and zero in our era, and these guys lost four Super Bowls in a row? No offense, uh, but how, how's Andre Reed in, in the in the Hall of Fame and Roger Craig is exactly. not? Uh, how how is that? Is it just solely uh, based 
on Pro Bowls? Is that what it is? Do you, you know, what about? I think it was percent? Jesse. I think it's the. I, I I really think in Rogers' case, and maybe in some of the other players' case, I think it was the passing of Bill Walsh. I think Walsh was held in such high regard in the football world that he would have spent his his retired years touting his Hall of Fame players for the Hall, and his voice and his opinion in within the game carried so much weight um, that, and in the absence of Bill, um, there really wasn't anybody to argue the case for guys like yourself or Roger or you know. There's others. I mean, I think Michael Carter. Is a exactly. is a Hall of Famer. Exactly. Um, you know, I mean, there's others. I mean, I, I got to ask you this: my my good friend who passed this year, the the late great Biller Bannock, I was his quality control defensive coach in the Canadian League. He happened to be, and this was in like, uh, um, you know, ninety four, ninety five. Um, he happened to be the Bengals D line coach in eighty nine when you guys beat them in the Super Bowl, and we used to talk about that. Uh, you know, so much back then about how, you know, they lost David Crum, I uh, lost uh, Crumry in that game right. to a gruesome right. injury. And David Grant, a young kid out of West Virginia, stepped in. He played great. And he probably played against guys like yourself. You probably remember David Grant better than you want to. But he, Billy also told me a story that I've gotten confirmed by a couple different people. And I just wanted your perspective on it. He claims that Michael Carter had a huge impact in winning that Super Bowl. And his claim was that Michael Carter, who kind of lined up cockeyed on the nose sometimes, got right in Dave Remington, who was the Bengals center's ear, on that third down play where Esiason was trying to punch it in for a game-clinching touchdown and just started screaming the cadence as loud as he possibly could. (laughs) And that Remington got flustered, he snapped it, it fumbled, the Bengals fell on it, but they were forced to kick the field goal, and you guys got it back with a chance to win the Super Bowl. Billy's contention was that that was all Michael Carter, that that he they even talked to Remington about it afterwards, and Remington said, yeah, he started barking out the cadence, and I couldn't hear Boomer, and I could hear Carter, and, and so I just snapped it, and... That was that wind up being a pivotal play. Without that incredible defensive heads up play by Michael Carter, maybe they score a touchdown there. Maybe they they put that game out of reach for Joe Montana. Uh, the rest is history. Montana found Taylor at the end for the game winner. Had you ever heard that anecdote about Carter barking out a cadence like that? Had it ever happened to you in practice from Michael? Because you practiced head to head against him. No. No, I, it, it never happened in practice with Stump, you know. And and Mike, Michael Carter's a great player, but you know that's the Cincinnati Bengals story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you you're absolutely right, you know. And and I felt for Tim Crumry because I broke my left leg the same way he broke the tibia, and he played with uh, reckless abandon. Great, great you know, player. Man, a movement man, nose player. guard. Not Michael was, Carter. More smaller and so faster. Hard. He was trying so hard to push himself back when Roger Craig cut it back that, you know, here's another story, Larry, that, that uh, you, you probably would, you know, enjoy. That particular grass that we played on was uh, at the Super Bowl was done by uh, Greg Norman's company. Yeah, Greg Norman, the shark, the golfer, yep. yeah, right. the, the golfer. Bermuda was it Bermuda grass? Well, or something? well, it was. It was not the best grass for uh, football. It looked great and he felt great walking on it, but when he started playing on it, if if you remember, a, a lot of people had problems with that grass. It didn't give uh, naturally like grass that would just grow from God given soil, a type of deal. Uh, the MVP for our defense in that game was Kevin Fagan. You remember Kevin another Fagan? underrated player. What another an underrated great player he was! Underrated player. And if you go back and watch the film, Kevin had a great game against a guy named Anthony Munoz. If you go back and watch wow. the film, honestly, Kevin Fagan had a great game against Anthony Munoz. When you can. You know, he, I don't know if he, he didn't dominate, but when you can win your half of the game against one of the greatest tackles to ever play, that's how you win football games, you know. And if you look at Larry, if you look at the game carefully, it was close because we turned the ball over twice in the first half. 
Yeah. Because we had a total of 435 yards total offense. If we didn't turn the ball over, that game probably wouldn't have been close. Here's the other here's the other thing that we're having fun talking about. What team, Larry, has given up more kickoff returns for touchdowns in Super Bowls than the San Francisco 49ers? Stanley Stanley was it Stanley Wilson and nope, it was uh, Jennings. Remember Jennings, Jennings? Brand, Brandon uh Stanford Jennings. Stanford Jennings and also up. in in the other in the Super Bowl against um against um uh who was it that took one back in eighty four? In eighty four someone took one back, right? Uh was no, it for it the was, Dolphins? Uh did that did that happen in eighty four? No, I don't maybe I'm maybe I'm confusing my years. Ninety four the Chargers took one one. Oh, one, that's whatever. right. Chargers had that was like basically all the Chargers did in that game yeah, was that one right. play. <laughs> that made yeah. it interesting for about two minutes. Yeah, uh, exactly. Jesse, no, I, I gotta Baltimore. Oh go ahead. Baltimore. Oh, that's right. But you know, the Baltimore one, the Jacoby Jones, <laughs> nobody was held worse than Bruce Miller, who got held sandwiched right there, and the guy ran right on by. That one, I, I to this day, that Super Bowl drives me crazy. I got to ask you about a comparison between Roger Craig. Roger Craig, you were there for the thousand thousand. You were there when Roger busted a thousand yards rushing, a thousand yards receiving. It was an incredible year. My contention is the Niners may have used Roger even a little too much because by the time they got to the playoffs, Roger didn't have a lot left. But I'm watching Christian McCaffrey, and I'm seeing Jimmy Garoppolo, Jesse, play his best football. And I don't. I think it's cause and effect. I think, I think John Lynch deserves a ton of credit because he acquired the perfect weapon to help Jimmy Garoppolo make it to that next level. I don't know if the Niners are going to win the Super Bowl, but I think they got a great shot now with McCaffrey. Give me your give me your thoughts on what Roger added as a safety valve and what you see from McCaffrey and and just overall what you think of this group of Niner weapons as they make this run for trying to win that sixth Lombardi. Well, I, I think <clears throat> the one thing that people admire about Roger is running those wide zones outside zones with those long high knees uh, high stepping i don't think mccaffrey has those long uh, high stepping knees but i think mccaffrey can play the slot you know pretty well not saying that roger couldn't play you know the, the slot position i think that the uh, the fact that mccaffrey gives us a lot of flexibility to spread the field a little bit you know and the great thing about it is is mitchell is starting to show up also for us. Yeah, really take underrated some player. Of that pressure, take some of that pressure off of of, uh, of Christian because, like you said, Larry, we don't want to just pound Christian all the time right now because we need to save him as we, you know, if we, you know, God willing, we, we, we which everything points in, in the way we're going to win this division and take it over. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so the, the difference is uh, – I think McCaffrey can play the slot maybe just a little bit better because he takes shorter steps, you know. I, I think Roger can r run the outside zone a little bit better than than uh, Christian, but they're both great coming out, you know, from the backfield and, and, and catching the ball. Uh, this particular uh, 49er team, you know, people ask me in Mexico, you know, compared to weapons, I said, this team has weapons. And John Lynch is, and, 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 and Kyle did a nice job, you know. This team has weapons, but here's the difference. They need to close the deal, you know. They got to finish. They, they got to finish it, absolutely. They have to finish it. And if they do finish it, you know, people are still, when they look at our era, you know, they, they look at championships. I don't think this era needs to win five championships to have the same effect that we had with the five. They, if they give us two and get us to seven championships, Larry, their, their legacy would just be as big as ours. Yep. You know? Cemented, uh, cemented yeah. in Niner lore. Jesse, uh, we're going to let you go. I know Ryan probably has one more one for you, but I got to say to you that I personally think I'll tell you what brings me a lot of pride, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I just I think when I think of the 49ers of your era, and I'm seeing it now in this era as well, um, and there's been some down times in between, but family is what I think about. Family. Eddie D, family. Even with Jed now, family. 
Um, but to me, what makes me really the proudest to be a 49er fan and to be associated in any way with the organization is the Golden Heart Fund. Because it, they're, play, you know, football, we take, take, take from the players. It's the most popular sport in America, but the players can't have guaranteed contracts. It's, you know, easily the most dominant, you know, entity as far as a, a sport in America. And yet there's plenty of players that are hurting and have to have second jobs after their career's done and their minds not the same and their bodies broken. So I just love the fact that the 49ers have established the Golden Heart Fund. And Eddie D, it's in his heart. Jed, it's in his heart. Uh, talking to other players, it's in their heart. You know, some players do very, very, very well. You'll get uh, Harris Barton and Brent Jones and Steve Young and guys like yourself doing very well after their career. And then there's guys who fall on tough times and they're not doing really well and they need not a hand out, but a hand up, you know, kind of a thing. And I just, I, to me, it just makes me proud to say I'm a 49er fan, proud to be associated with the franchise, a franchise that cares about its players and takes care of its players and whose players have come together to ensure that that's the case into the future. I love the golden heart fund. I'm all about it. Anytime I can give anything to it, I do. Give me your thoughts on on that because you know the people that need the help and you know the the, the need that needs to be met. Um, and the 49ers, you know, this is not falling on deaf ears. They've, they, 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 they have a lot of money, but they also care about their own. Once you're a Niner, you're a Niner for life. They take care of their own. Um, it's a great source of pride. Give me, your, give me your, your thought on the Golden Heart Fund, which was created relatively recently. Yeah, I think it's one of the, it's another way the 49ers are becoming trendsetters, you know, and, and I hope we are trendsetters when it comes to that. You know, I, I give the kids of today, today's players, you know, credit for still thinking of us a little bit, you know, even though they make a whole lot more money, but our union is, is a little bit better at that, but it's still not enough, Larry. You, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky I played 15 years, which rather I screwed my money up for two years, I still played long enough, you know, to to be able to put myself in a position to where, you know, I'm comfortable and I'm happy with my afterlife. Not everybody plays 15 years. Those guys that play three years, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of the, the athletes, you know, we play thinking that we're going to play 10 to 15 years, but that never happens. So major the majority of the players – of my past teammates play five, six years. It doesn't take much with people with their hands out to take that money from you, you know, and now you're in trouble, you know, because we're always, you know, when, when we retire, you know, Larry, and why people, why we cry during a retirement announcement is not because we played in the NFL. It's because it's something that we've done since we were five years old. It's all we know to us. We got paid later. Yes. But mentally, it's the only thing that we've known all our lives. So when the noise stops and we have to make that adjustment to life after football, it is very, very tough for a majority of us. And a lot of our guys do struggle. And for Eddie and, and Jed to start the Golden Heart Fund, I spoke to the workers who sell the 50-50 at the stadium about uh, uh, three weeks ago. And they went out and sold more than they've ever done. But we do that, you know, and I was very proud of that because uh, we were able to uh, contribute 60000 uh during the Kansas City Week to the Golden Heart Fund with the, with the heart of uh, with the volunteers that, that are out there, you know. And, and I just said to the volunteers, you know, we played the game with the standard that we played for each other like our, our lives depended on on every single game because we wanted to please our fans. And I think my brothers that are struggling deserves, you know, um, to be helped because not only are they struggling financially, Larry, there's a, a lot of my brothers are struggling, you know, uh, mentally and emotionally. Yeah, and emotionally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's like I said, you know, uh, Eddie and, and, and Jed are trendsetters with this thing, and, and I hope other teams can follow suit. 
Yeah. No, when Eddie spoke at the Hall of Fame, it was like, yes, man. I, I pumped my fist. I was like, you know, he described it as a family and how we need how the NFL needs to do better. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think his his words, uh, you know, fell on deaf ears. I think Eddie's a trendsetter. I think he's a leader. I think he's beloved by his players and around the league for that kind of generosity, uh, which defined his his leadership and and that family approach. You still feel it today. Ryan and I were in the locker room earlier today, Jesse, and you know it's it's day before Thanksgiving, and you know the players are probably going to be off tomorrow, at least from the media and. And it's just, you know, the vibe was so good. I mean, it's just such, they, they are in a really good place right now. Guys are getting along. The team's coming together. Guys are getting healthy. And you can just feel the the the, the camaraderie in the room and the momentum. So um, who knows? Who knows where it will go? But, Ry, you got one for Jesse before? I know Ry's a younger guy, so he doesn't hasn't seen all your all your games, Jesse. But if you got one for Jesse, fire away here, Ry. Well, I was going to ask about Burford and Banks, and and I was also going to bring up how, you know, the locker room, like Larry was saying, I mean, it it feels, this is my first locker room I've been in, and it, but that said, I mean, I don't know, gut feeling, it feels like a kind of a championship locker room, and everybody's getting along, everybody's super cool, all the vets we talked to, we talked to Willie Sneed today, you know, the guy's been in locker rooms with Drew Brees. He's been with the Ravens, with Lamar Jackson. He's like, man, San Francisco's awesome. We got them all to give us a pitch on uh, why Aaron Judge should come to San Francisco. So, <laughs> which, by the way, I heard if, that. By <laughs> the way if, 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 if you want to give a pitch, go ahead. But, uh, no, I, I mean, we're going on four. We told you four, fif, 15 minutes. Uh, we're going on 40. Uh, just let me know your uh, your thoughts on uh, going forward for this 49ers team and what, what, what your heart says. What your heart and your gut says. Well, I, I, I love this team for the reason that Larry's saying it's team over self, which is really, really hard to find nowadays. Um, some of the great players on, 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 on teams that you can tell that has a little spice to their attitude, when things are going well, things can work out. But when the going gets tough, you know, like Ramsey, the the, D, the DB for the Rams, started finger pointing a little bit a couple of weeks back. You know, um, you, you look at you know things start coming apart at the seams, and you kind of, Larry, you've been around the game. You kind of read into certain things that should stay in the locker room, should stay within the family. It's starting to leak out, and I, and I'm saying this with Ramsey because they just won the World Championship last year. You know, how can things come? you know, a part of the seams that fast. The one thing that's great about our guys is last year we started three and five. We were an interception, a dropped interception away from probably going to another Super Bowl. Our guys fought all the way back. We didn't have the greatest start this year either. And and in a stretch where we lost to um, Atlanta, it was probably our worst defensive game. It's because we were, you know, we were devastated with injuries, especially on the D line. You know, and Marcus Mariota is, a, you know, I'm close to the family. You know, he was great was thinking, that day, wasn't he? I, yeah. And, and, you know, and, and Marcus because he could run. But at the same time, we were decimated, you know, especially at the defensive tackle position. So we, we couldn't stop their run. And that, that game was probably the worst uh, we looked. Uh, defensively, and it kind of it kind of leaked over to the first Rams game because that first half, I'm thinking, wow, how long are we going to struggle? And then we came back in the second half on our defense tightened up, you know, and then we played, uh, you know, Kansas City and 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 uh, uh, no, we played Kansas City. We didn't look good that, there either. But the Rams second half, we started getting our our, uh, our mojo back. Um, we played the Chargers, who has, has a great quarterback. We struggled a little bit in the first drive, and then we tightened everything up. We looked great in Mexico. That's just the way a marathon is. You know, it's 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 an up and down thing. But the team that stays strong in the locker room and stay together will get on the roll at some point. And we have more weapons now than we had last year, you know. And I Absolutely. think that's that's going to be the difference. Once if our offense gets in rhythm, and our defense plays consistently the way they've been the last two games, uh, I would take our team over anybody. I know Dallas looked good this past week, 
But they, they don't stop the run. Two weeks ago. <laughs> they don't stop the run, and the Niners are going to bring a full dose of the run. Right. Jesse, we love you, brother. Niner fans everywhere love you. This is a podcast that's going back to the U.K. You're a big part of of uh, what the reason the 49ers are a global brand. Uh, the reason that that pat the, the reason eighty eight percent of that Mexico City Stadium was Niner fans because of guys like you and um, and same in same in London you know the the Niners are a global brand and and you're a part of establishing that so thank you very much for joining us on this Tales from the Bay podcast thanks for for going overtime and 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 telling stories with us I'm sure the the fans in London who are going to get a chance to see this podcast are going to greatly appreciate it. And we wish you nothing, uh, you and your family, nothing but a phenomenal holiday uh, weekend here at Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's ahead. And hopefully we'll see you out at uh, Levi's before the end of the year. Well, thank you, Larry. And thank you, Ryan. Uh, You know, wish uh, you and your family the best Thanksgiving to the faithfuls. You know, happy Thanksgiving, faithfuls, and also uh, to our faithfuls and, uh, in the UK, you know, we went to London twice to try to promote the game back then uh, yep. in preseason games. And uh, uh, it's, it's an exciting season. And I think we're starting to, to get into a role and take over this division. I feel good about our team. And go Niners. Go Niners. Go Niners. We'll finish on that one. Coming up next, we'll talk a little bit to super fan Paul Hope, who's going to join us on the podcast. Larry Kruger, Ryan Smith, the Tales from the Bay podcast, talking Niner football in advance of Niners and Saints. We've got more straight ahead. Welcome back to the Tales from the Bay podcast. Larry Kruger, Ryan Smith. We're joined by Paul Hope, who joins us from the UK as we look ahead to the 49ers and the New Orleans Saints. And guys, not only are the 49ers playing terrific football, not only is Jimmy Garoppolo uh, taking this offense to another level, not only is the addition of Christian McCaffrey taking this offense to a different level, and not only are are the Niners looking good on offense, they're getting healthier on defense but four of the next five games are at home at Levi Stadium, starting with this Sunday against the New Orleans Saints. Andy Dalton, the Red Rifle, uh, he's been he's replaced Jameis Winston as a starting quarterback, and the uh, Saints roll in with a pretty good defense and some interesting offensive weapons. And um, it's going to be—I I think it's going to be a very tough game for the 49ers because I think the Saints are a really good um, really good team on defense with a lot of phenomenal singular talents or individual talents. How do you guys see Niners Saints? I think it's really important for the Niners to win this one and kind of win it, it by a comfortable margin because the you know what they just did to Arizona that's what they need to start doing to these lesser teams. This is a home game versus the Saints versus Andy Dalton. Um, if they win this one, then after that, then they can kind of afford to maybe slip up because they've got after that, they've got home Miami, good team, home Bucks. They may have it figured out by then. Then at Seattle, then home these, you know, plucky red or uh, <laughs> commanders. Uh, and then at Las Vegas and then home Arizona. So, they need they need this win, and I don't understand what the Saints are even doing really with Andy Dalton. I don't know what you guys think about that. Like I feel like just play Jameis at this point, or uh, I don't know, play Taysom Hill. It's just it's just Andy Dalton is not the future of this team. Um, but no, I, I think the Saints are they have a good defense. Um, I just feel like the Niners are the, the Saints aren't going to be able to score enough. Uh, to keep up with the Niners at this point. I mean, the Dalton thing makes sense to me from the standpoint of, um, you know, 14 touchdowns, seven picks. You know, he he you know he's only he's been sacked 13 times in eight games. Will, uh, Winston was sacked 11 times in three games and had four touchdowns and five picks. I agree. Taysom Hill, I don't think, is a full time NFL quarterback. Um, but I I'll, I'll say this: I think the 49ers game plan is very clear in this game as well. And if you look at the Saints' statistical breakdown as a team, what you're going to find is that they give up 132 yards rushing per game. Uh, they've given up 11 rushing touchdowns. So to me, that's that's where the game plan starts right there. This is a run-heavy game plan uh, against a New Orleans team that struggles to stop the run. A lot of McCaffrey, a lot of Mitchell, 
Uh, maybe even some Jordan Mason late if you can get a lead. But I think this is a run-heavy game plan, uh, just looking across at what, what New Orleans has defensively. How do you see the matchup, Paul? I think it'll be the defense, our defense versus their offense, obviously, with the number one ranked defense in the league. And when I look at the stats, Larry, the Saints are 23rd on offense. And like Ryan said, I'm not an Andy Dalton fan. It's been interesting to see them go back to this two QB system where sometimes they bring Taysom Hill in. Is he going to run the ball? Is he going to throw the ball? I am impressed, Ryan, by Olave. I took him in a few of my fantasy teams. I think he's someone, Larry, that we need to keep an eye on. But our secondary's got better and better. I mean, look at what we did with D-Hop. Looked quite good in the first couple of drives, but we adjusted. And I'm not saying that Olav is as good as DeAndre Hopkins. Of course I'm not, but he's a weapon to keep an eye on. But I'm I'm confident in this defence. And I think Andy Dalton is in for a busy night, Larry, with Nick Bosa, hungry for more sacks. Um, Charles, um, I can't pronounce his surname, number 94, King Charles, we've nicknamed him over this side of the pond. He's been immense recent weeks, and I think Ryan's is going to dial up that pressure against um, Andy Dalton. But I think you're right. I think this is going to be a similar game plan to the Chargers. I think it'll be quite run heavy. I think we've got the nice one-two of Mitchell and CMC. And I'll stick my neck on the line and say Jimmy goes four games in a row, Larry, without an interception, because the way Jimmy's playing at the moment, I just think he's going to keep doing what he's doing. I think Kyle Shanahan's going to keep it as simple as what we've seen. And I'm looking forward to, like you said, Ryan, a bit of a blowout win. Especially, I've got the plug that my good friend Lee Gowland from the 49er Faithful UK, who's the president, Larry, he will be in attendance at Levi's with his Sammy Womack 26 jersey on. So we're <laughs> all pulling for uh, a big win on Sunday Night Football. You know, the the Saints, you know, the, you think of the Saints and, um, yeah, they've been a strong defense. I thought it was interesting that they got rid of Chauncey Gardner-Johnson at the beginning of the year and, Look what look what uh, he's done for the Eagles defense, but man, you know the cupboard is not bare in the secondary. I mean, this might be one of the better secondaries um, that the Niners go up against. You got Paulson Adebo, the former Stanford corner, Chris Harris Jr. is a terrific corner in the slot. Marcus Lattimore, who's questionable for this game, is one of the NFL's better corners. And then you got Tyron Matthew, the Honey Badger, who's a, at free safety, and he's got tremendous ball skills. And Marcus May is, has been known to make a lot of plays. So it's a it's a really it's a defense that I think strength is is in the secondary. Um, but I think you can move them up front, and I think you're going to see. You know, I think it it will be a run heavy game plan. But um, you know, I th- I think more than anything, you want to keep the ball out of the air against this secondary. This is a Saints secondary that will pick off passes and, and, and has the ability. they got four guys there with, with well above average ball skills. So that'll be huge. And then I think the key on the for the Niner defense, <clears throat> and we didn't really hit on it too much in the Arizona recap, but watching the Niner-Arizona game again, guys, the thing that stood out to me was just how incredibly hard the 49ers hit the Cardinal receivers every time they touched the ball, they K they, you know, they KO'd Rondell Moore. He left early. Um, I, I believe D hop was dinged up at the end of that game. Uh, McBride, the young tight end out of Colorado state got smoked. The 49ers are hitting so hard in the secondary in this game. I think it's going to, the, the challenge for the defense is going to be to wrap up on Alvin Kamara because, you know, Kamara, the one thing about Kamara, he's not Barry Sanders, but he's got Barry Sanders-like um, strength in his legs. And he's just a really tough guy to bring down as a, in, in a solo tackle in the, open, in the open field. So I think gang tackling and rapping against Alvin Kamara would be the number one, number one thing to look for. And then Olave's got huge speed. And so you don't want to, you know, let him make plays down the field. But I think you run it, you dominate time of possession, you make them one-sided, you wrap against Kamara, and um, I think once you get ahead on the scoreboard, it's jailbreak on on uh, on um, the red rifle. And I think there's a very good chance they, they can put them on the turf four or five times in that game if the 49ers can get a lead in the first half. So I think the Niners win this game, but... You know the the I don't know if it, what it is about the atmosphere at home, but the Niners sometimes are a little lackadaisical and play down to their opponents at home. So I kind of hope that um, you know they take New Orleans seriously because the Saints have the ability to beat you if you don't show up. Yeah, they don't have the 
they don't have the benefit of the doubt of of these teams like the Chiefs or or, or e- even the Eagles at this point that just you know one two three losses like the Niners have to keep winning games so they that it's going to really show a lot about the team I think if they come out and just like you know steamroll keep keep the uh, foot on the pedal and just like steamroll the Saints um, I think it's a bad look if they kind of let up again because that's sort of showing their bad habits but history history of the Shanahan team has shown that um, you know they get stronger as the year goes on and when the weather turns they they're tougher than almost anybody in the league. So I'm, I'm expecting them to, you know, perform well. And I don't know about covering that big old spread though. I think it's like 10 now. Uh, see, that's a little scary. Uh, Paul, that's a, big, that's a big number. Yeah. Paul, what are your thoughts? Well, Larry raised a good point there. Kamara is a good running back and obviously we're without Kinlaw and Armstead, but I've been impressed with Ridgeway and Givens and I thought McGill played quite well, Larry. I mean, I know yeah. he didn't have a great deal to do, but James Connor and the Cardinals came in with a run-heavy kind of look. But um, I also think you're right. I was quite impressed by the cornerbacks against the Cardinals. It's not a position that you normally see tough tackling. And Mooney Ward was putting the hits on DeAndre Hopkins. And that was great to see. I mean, we can't speak highly enough of Ward on this side of the pond. I mean, I, I said it at the start of the year. I love the arrogance that he took number seven which in the UK is normally an offensive number. It's normally heralded in, on a soccer jersey. So the fact that you've got a defensive player wearing that, and I think he's added that confidence. And for me, Fred Warner, Fred Warner's just the MVP of this team on defence. I mean, he recorded six tackles, two tackles for a loss, a quarterback hit. And I think he brings that energy that you're saying, Larry. So even if Kamara can get past the front, he's then got to get past the linebackers. And we've got a pretty decent set of linebackers. So... I don't know about a score prediction at this stage, Ryan. I, I could try and give you one. Um, I think the over-under is set at 43. So it depends on which way you're going to look at this. But I don't see us blowing them out like we did the Cardinals. But equally, we, we've held teams to, on average 13 points if you take the Chiefs game out of there. And I don't see the Saints offence coming in and causing that many problems. So I'm looking at like a 28-14 to 14 victory on Sunday night. Oh, Paul, you know what? I got. Th- How about this one? Do the Niners shut out the Saints in the second half? Do we go four in, <laughs> four in a row? That would be a bold prediction. What do you think, Larry? Do you think we can do that? <laughs> well, first of all, don't confuse people. It's Sunday night in the UK, but it's a one oh five game uh, in the afternoon uh, you know, uh, on the Pacific Coast. Um, I, I think it's going to be a tough game. I, I just think, you know, from the standpoint of, uh, New Orleans flies around. They'll make some plays. Dalton's hard to confuse. Um, he's got some speed. He's got a pretty good little safety valve himself in, in Kamara. I think both their tight ends are pretty good, too. Troutman and, and Johnson, yeah. So um, I think the 49er D-line, especially if the Niners can get some separation on the scoreboard, could really dominate this Saints offensive line in pass protection um, You know, with pass rush in the um, in the second half that's what I'm looking for but I, I think it's a run heavy I think it's a run heavy scheme or at least a very you know passing short kind of a scheme and getting the ball out of Jimmy's hands in kind of safety in a, in a safe way I don't think you're gonna see Jimmy taking tons of shots down the field in the air in this game I just think the secondary is has a few too many playmakers in it I think they'll be a tad more conservative but if they as long as the 49ers can you know can not turn it over and that's been their their strength recently is they've 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 eradicated the mass turnovers if they can stay on that formula and not turn it over in mass i think that this is their game to win totally agree uh yeah it's i i think if i'm gonna bet anything on this game i'm just gonna i'm just gonna bet niners to win the second half (laughs) <laughs> why not you know as, as long as this continues i'm i you know i might go under you know i, I kind of like if, if you say what what's your angle on uh on you know wagering on this game i like the under why because i think i think uh the saints will make a few plays uh against this niner defense i think D'Amico has kind of shown at different times he'll play like a bend but don't break kind of a defense um and that takes some clock that works the clock and then you look at what the saints are against the run uh, I think it'll be a run-heavy scheme, and you know Shanahan feels good when the Niners get any kind of a lead. He likes to run, 
you know, he likes to run at the beginning of games. He likes to run at the end of games. Um, so to me, that it, it's it just kind of screams go at the under. I think both defenses should win out. So I, I think it'll be a low score, you know, a scheme a little bit on the lower scoring side. Hey, last thing before we uh, call it an episode, Paul, got to get your opinions on. Uh, so I know obviously uh, Thanksgiving is an American holiday, but I have to imagine that it's just kind of awesome. Uh, if you're an NFL fan outside of the United States, it's, you know, you get three, three games on a Thursday. So even if you're at work, you know, you can kind of, plus the world cup. <laughs> I mean, seriously, they should just let you off work for that. But I mean, it's just an excuse to eat and drink and kind of be a slob and watch football. Uh, so yeah, I was sort of wondering what the, uh, Thanksgiving football setup is over across the pond. So to, to clarify what Larry said earlier, you guys are eight, how, eight hours behind. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. So the Thanksgiving in the UK is, is massive because, like you said there, we get three NFL games, Larry. So when I finish work at 5 o'clock tomorrow, I can put the TV on and I can look forward to Buffalo, Detroit at half past five in the evening in the UK. Then we've got the Giants at the Cowboys at half past nine. Then there's the New England at uh, Minnesota, but that's at 20 past one in the morning. And given the fact that I support a West Coast team and a lot of our games are at 20 past one in the morning, um, I won't be staying up for that one. But it is kind of creeping in some of the traditions. And I was saying to you off air, Ryan, that a lot of my friends will watch the games, we'll be in a group chat, we'll have American snacks, we'll have American food, we'll set our fantasy lineups. And like you said, it's just a great day of sport in the UK. And the games are on back-to-back as well on Sky Sports over here. So I kind of would like to see the Niners play on Thanksgiving because that hasn't happened yet. I know traditionally like the Lions always play on Thanksgiving and the Cowboys play, but it would have been awesome finishing work at 5 o'clock tomorrow and my beloved 49ers being on the TV at half past five. But it's a 9 o'clock kickoff for me on Sunday night, Larry, which is a lot better than one in the morning. But yes, it'll be five past one in the afternoon. Uh, in California, so I hope my friend Lee Gowland has his sun cream on because we're not used to the sun in the northeast <laughs> of England. So I'm hoping he's uh, taking the right precautions. But I'm looking forward to the game. Should be good stuff. Um, you know, I think I'm going Bills. Uh, Bills. I'm, I think I'm going teaser on the Bills. So I'm going Bills minus two over the Lions, and then uh, Giants Cowboys. The total is forty five and a half. I I'll tease that up. To like forty three to like fifty three, and then go under. So I, I like uh, Cowboys Giants to be a little on the low scoring game, low scoring side. I think Saquon Barkley is going to have a lot of success running the ball against the Cowboys in that game. Um, and then I'm really eager to see what the Vikings look like on that in the night game. The last time the 49ers played on Thanksgiving, I believe it was a Sunday night game against the uh, Baltimore Ravens in Baltimore. But this is Patriots Vikings in Minneapolis, and I don't know what side to go for on that one. But the Vikings, I believe, have a negative point differential despite being eight and two. So I don't know. I'm I, that might be a stay away game. That might just be a di- you know digest the turkey and get into the tryptophan coma on the uh, on the couch watching that one. Absolutely. And uh, just to, as we're going out, uh, this is the teams in order of point differential because it's interesting because the vikings are the first team ever to be what are they eight and two with a negative point differential it's bills plus 107 cowboys plus 84 eagles plus 80 chiefs plus 67 niners plus 63 so that's a that's a group right there bills cowboys eagles chiefs niners that sounds about right a lot of the point differential is an interesting way to look at it for sure of course, one blowout will distort everything, um, but, you know, that's just kind of the way it goes. All right, good stuff. Paul, good to see you, man. Happy Thanksgiving to uh, you and your family, and uh, enjoy your football viewing pleasures, and uh, uh, go Niners. Go Niners. Hopefully they get a win against the Saints, and it's always good to wrap with you. No, thanks for having me on. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. I know it's a big holiday over there. And anything I can do to help you guys with the podcast, just hit me up. You know where I am. And it was great to see you talking TED Talks ball, Larry, because um, Ted had me on last week. So to be on the nice. same show that you've been on is uh, pretty epic for a fan in the UK. But I've loved chatting all things football with you. And thanks for having me on. It's much appreciated. Oh, and, oh, and Paul, Paul, make sure to plug your podcast. 
Yeah, plug the podcast. Where can people check you out? So I'm mainly on Twitter, Larry. So at Paul underscore Hope 10. But I also run the at 49 FAFL UK, which is tied in with Gridiron. So we're working very closely with you guys at Gridiron, you know, sharing content and promoting the podcasts. So they promote your podcast in our group. But we drop our own podcast at the 49 FAFL UK. We do a preview show and we do a review show. So if anybody does want to check them out, hit me up on my DMs and I'll be more than happy to share you the links. So it's four fans in the UK, Larry, that talk about the game. We do what you guys have just done, but we put a UK perspective on it. And we're, we're doing all right. We've had about 20,000 downloads in the last year. So we're getting bigger and bigger, awesome. bigger and bigger. So I think that does help that our president announced Sammy Womack's pick in Vegas. So <laughs> we've got um, large shoes to fill when it comes to that. Well, congratulations on that. More, you know, we wish you nothing but great growth and success with that in the days and years ahead. And uh, Paul, have a phenomenal few days, and and we would love to have you back on the Tales from the Bay podcast. So stay by the phone. All right, thanks very much. <laughs> Paul Hope checking in. Tales from the Bay podcast. If you're checking it out for the first time, and you can find it anywhere you can find your podcast. You can find Tales from the Bay. Check it out.